Friday night, and we're going to start a new series tonight. Last week, we finished the series on complex trauma and healing from complex trauma. And what I have found over the years, and especially when I do a series on healing from complex trauma, is one of the themes that we talked about, if you're going to heal from complex trauma, is you need a healthy support system. And I get probably the two most common questions are, where in the world do I find healthy people in our culture today? And how do I create this healthy support system? And I think those are excellent questions, important questions, but there is not an easy answer to them. A couple of reasons. We live in a culture today where many of the support systems that are being offered aren't super healthy. Also, when you get a lot of more healthy people, many of them don't get complex trauma. And so when they work with people from complex trauma, they don't get their struggles. And often their thinking is superficial fixes, not deep change that is needed. And so these healthier people who don't get it end up being people potentially who re-wound or hurt people from complex trauma just because of not understanding. And so those are just common factors that people from complex trauma have to face as they move into healing, but it also makes them realize finding a healthy support system is going to be difficult. How do I do that? And so that's what I want to do in this new series is finding a healthy support system. And it's a very complex topic and it sounds like it might be simple but I want you to think it through carefully with me so that you realize just how complex this is because there's just so many factors to be considered but before we get to that I want you to think of families and I want to think that all of us potentially has five different families that we live in the obvious one is our biological family, the family to which we were born. That is what we normally think of when we think of a family. What I want to say about that is that the biological family has the greatest influence or impact on a child greater than anything else, greater than school, etc. And I think the reason is, is that when a child is born into a family, they're kind of wired or preconditioned to absorb everything possible from that biological family. Problem is, they absorb everything, whether it's good or bad. And so if the family's not healthy, they absorb a whole lot of negative influence. But the biological family is the most influential for the first 15 to 20 years of a person's life. And they continue to have influence even beyond that. And then the second family is what we would call our extended biological family. Grandma and grandpa, aunts and uncles, cousins, all of those people. And they can have a tremendous influence in a child's life as well, both for good or for bad. Then the third is kind of the family that we choose for ourselves out of our peer group. And usually we choose this based on common interests. And those are our friends. And so we, they're the people we choose to hang around with, the people we gain support from, and the people we choose to be influenced by. And so friends carry a lot of influence and it's our choice as to who our friends would be. So for some people, you could say that's kind of a surrogate, self-chosen family. The fourth family is the family you choose based on who you choose to love for life. A romantic relationship that says, let's get married or let's move in together. Let's have kids together. And now you create your own biological family based on love. Now, a couple things just to say about that is what a person deals with when they create their own biological family is I still have my birth family and now I have this family I've created out of love, 
which one has the greatest influence in my life? Which one should I listen to most, my partner or my parents? Which one is the greater priority, my partner or my parents? And every person faces that choice as they head into this creating your own biological family. And most people quickly realize is when you put your birth family ahead of your partner, it leads to trouble. And so people have to sort that out. And then the final family are the in-laws or the family that comes with your partner's family. So five different families, all having certain amounts of influence in my life today. Second thing I want you to be reminded of, really, is that we have seen over the last years as we've worked through complex trauma that science, the social sciences, are showing very clearly that if a child is to grow up and become healthy, they need two major things. Number one, they need secure attachment. And what that means is they need to have an emotional, deep emotional connection with someone bigger than them, someone wiser than them, someone who loves them, someone who becomes their rock, someone that they can rely on, someone they can trust to help meet their needs, someone who's going to teach them healthy tools so that they can live a healthy life. That secure attachment is absolutely vital. To not have it, we have seen, creates complex trauma. So complex trauma is all about insecure attachment. But the second thing is that in order to have secure attachment, you need, the child needs to feel safe. And that means that the people they're attaching to have to be healthy and safe people. Without the people that they are attaching to being healthy and safe, they will never have a secure attachment. So safety is a priority. So that's where I want to now go. How do you distinguish between a safe person and an unsafe person? And over the years, I have spent hours teaching on this, thinking about this, trying to figure out how do I present this in a way that people can really get. So let me just kind of show you how I've gone about it in my own mind. So when I think of safe versus unsafe, what I'm really talking about is a safe person can only be safe if, if they're a healthy person. So only, the only safe people are healthy people. Unsafe people are always unhealthy people. But then I have to take it a little bit further. I think we have seen, and I've talked to thousands of clients who would confirm it, that every child is born and comes into this world with this gut alarm system that has a sense of whether a person is safe or unsafe. In other words, children have this built-in code that helps them sense whether a person's healthy or not. Now, the tragedy of complex trauma is that children had to shut down or ignore that gut system. So they were living with that gut system warning them all the time that people around them weren't safe, but they couldn't do anything about it to make it a safer environment. And so to avoid kind of being pestered constantly by their gut, they just had to shut it down or ignore it. And so all the time when I talk to clients, how I present it is this. How many of you can sense a red flag when you meet a person? So you meet somebody and something in your gut, whether you choose to listen to it or not, but something in your gut says, danger, danger, something there's not safe. And everybody will put up their hands. And then I'll say, how many of you have ignored your gut, those red flags, and everybody will put up their hands. And so how I define unsafe for people to really get is that they get red flags or they sense red flags. And so that's what I want to talk about over the next while, the next few weeks, is 
what makes a person safe or unsafe? Or what are these red flags that we sense that tells us that this person isn't healthy? And what I want you to understand with that is that when you sense that a person isn't healthy, you feel a red flag, if you carry that out, if you get in a relationship with that person, what that then means is that you will have relationship problems down the road related to that red flag. So re red flags don't just indicate an unhealthy person. They also indicate the potential for unhealthy relationships if you get into a relationship with them. And so what I want to do is take you through a list of red flags and then begin to understand what is unhealthy there and what would healthy then look like in that area. Some of the red flags that we're going to look at are what I call deal breakers. So this would be a person who just, you catch them lying all the time or you catch them constantly being disrespectful or constantly lashing out in anger. And you sense that disrespect. You sense that dishonesty or you see it. Those are hopefully for you would be a deal breaker because you know to get in a relationship with this person is going to end badly. Some of the red flags, though, are not necessarily deal breakers. They're not pointing to huge character flaws. They're, they're more minor so this person is just messy or this person is forgetful. All of those type of things. They might cause you some challenges in the relationship, but that doesn't mean that they're deal breakers. So as we go through the list, I think it's hopefully you're going to be able to sort out in your mind red flags that should be deal breakers and red flags that you just need to investigate to see kind of how severe is this problem, what kind of issues might it cause down the road. And so our goal is to create a healthy support network. We need healthy or safe people. And in order to find healthy or safe people, we need to listen to our gut when it comes to red flags. And we need an understanding of those red flags. Now, there's going to be some spin-off applications to this. What you're going to also see is, if I'm going to be healthy, I need to point out in my own life the things that would cause other people to sense a red flag with me. So I can't be a safe person to my children or to other people unless I deal with these very same issues in my life. And then... What we're really getting at is the goal of recovery from complex trauma is to become healthy. And so the way to become healthy is to begin to deal with the things that would be red flags in my own life. So hopefully this will not just give you a shopping list of dating criteria, but that this will give you a roadmap about what you need to do in your own life, the areas you need to work on, to become healthier people. So today, I want to go through six red flags. All of them have to do with morals. And so let me begin by saying this. A healthy person lives by a moral code. A person who has red flags that are deal breakers is violating some moral code. Now that's point one. Point two is this. Though healthy people live by a moral code, some of the most unhealthy people also live by a moral code. But there's some differences, and that's what I want you to think about with me. And so number one, red flag, is when you sense a self-righteous person. Now a self-righteous person lives by a moral code. But a healthy person lives by a moral code and they have the attitude of humility. 
Even though I'm living by a moral code, that doesn't make me better than you. We're still equal. A self-righteous person lives by a moral code, but they have a different attitude. And their attitude is, I want to feel superior to people. And so I'm going to set a moral code where I can walk around and say, I don't lie, I don't cheat, I don't steal. That makes me better than you. Total difference. Self-righteous people are people who live by a moral code with an attitude of wanting to be superior. And they are very dangerous people. They can do a lot of damage. And so be aware of that. Now, one thing I want you to realize up front, when we start looking at these red flags, so do you see that a healthy person and a self-righteous person can look the same on the outside? Both are living by a moral code. And you might look at that person who's self-righteous and say, wow, they live a really good life. And you go and get in a relationship with them and all of a sudden, you're getting hurt because they need to feel superior to you. And so we can't just look at externals only when we look at red flags. We have to get beyond that to begin to look at attitudes. So some of the most dangerous people in the world, they've learned how to play the act of acting moral so you think of an abusive narcissist, when they meet, meet you, they can be the most polite, loving, kind, giving, respectful person until they've got you in a relationship and it all changes. And then their true attitude comes out and, their, and that moral code gets forgotten. And so we have to get beyond just external behavior to get to the attitude underneath. And that takes time. We can't necessarily figure that out right away. And so that requires patience in the process of getting to know a person so that I don't get too committed before I've learned their attitudes. Okay, let me give you a bit more about self-righteous people. Many self-righteous people will create their own moral code on top of just commonly understood moral code so they'll go beyond i don't lie i don't cheat i don't steal and then they'll add their own moral code so i don't swear i don't wear tattoos i don't have very many body piercings i wear modest clothes and they set up a thing that's their own moral code but now they use that to look down on people and so they create their own rules that make them feel self-righteous better than you so there's something in a self-righteous person and they may not even be aware of this but they gain a certain amount of pleasure from being able to judge or condemn people who don't live up to their moral code it's a sixth sense sense of satisfaction that comes from that self-righteousness so we're really what I think is going on often with self-righteous people is often it is people with a lot of shame that they've not dealt with in a healthy way. And so they are looking, so shame says, I feel less than you. I feel I don't have value just because of who I am. I feel that I'm not lovable as other people. And so I need to compensate for that somehow so that I feel better about myself. And so some people find a moral code. And they go, I'm going to jump through all these hoops. And that will make me better than you. And that will compensate for my shame. They still haven't dealt with their shame in a healthy way. But they are doing things to make themselves feel better. And those can be dangerous people. Now sadly... A lot of those people find their way into churches. And you would hope that churches would be full of safe people. They all seem to live by a moral code. But that's where you have to get beyond just the external actions. Because if you go to, into a church and you find people living by a moral code, what's their attitude with that? Are they humble or do they feel better than you? 
And the ones that feel better than you can be very dangerous people. So watch out. Red flag number one, self-righteousness. Red flag number two, people who live by a double standard. And we talk about this regularly. But people who live by a double standard, if you think about it, they, live by, they, they have a moral code. The problem is that they apply that moral code to everybody else except themselves. So everybody else can't lie, but they can lie when they need to. Everybody else can't cheat, but they can cheat if they want to. You can't look through their Facebook or their phone, but they can look through your Facebook or your phone. So they have a moral code. They just feel that they are exempt from it, but nobody else is. Now let me just say this. That is a huge red flag. When I see a person who's living by that kind of double standard, my mind as a counselor in this field goes to those are the potential marks of a narcissist and a person who becomes an abuser. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who has a double standard at times is a narcissist or an abuser. But what I'm saying is if you're meeting somebody and you get that sense or you see that double standard, Back away and go, okay, what's going on here? Because that could be super dangerous. Because that could actually be a person who is a narcissist or a person who ends up being abusive. And so pay close attention to the double standard red flag. There's a third one that involves morals. And that is that they redefine the moral code. So that their idea of faithfulness is different than yours. So you use the same word, I'm committed to being faithful, but they redefine it to suit them and it's different from yours. So a lot of people who are very unsafe will use all the same language that safe people will use the problem is they give it different definitions. So let me just take this faithful thing. Some people say, I'm committed to being faithful. But then as you query them, you begin to go understand that it goes like this. To them, if they hook up, some, hook up with somebody sexually that they're really not in love with, they don't see that as being unfaithful because they're not in love. Or they can have emotional intimacy through texting and sexting and all of those things, but they don't consider themselves to be unfaithful because they didn't sleep with that person. Different definition. Or they can watch porn or flirt with every woman they see or leer after every woman that walks by, and they don't consider that a problem because they didn't sleep with them. Different definition of faithful. So be aware of people who say they live by a moral code, but as you get to know them, you realize that there's a different definition. Now let me take that just a step further. What often happens for some people like that is there really is a double standard. So they can say, I can sleep with different women, and that's not being unfaithful to my partner because I don't love that person. But if their partner was to do that then they would not tolerate that. And so that's where you begin to see the flaws in their reasoning. Number four, and this one's tricky, you got to be careful. Get to know what their past relationships have been like. And if you see a pattern of cheating, be aware. Now, why this is tricky is this. Many of the people, or most of the people that I work with, have past marked by promiscuity. Lots of cheating, lots of sleeping around. But I believe people can change. And I believe when people begin to realize the damage that that kind of mindset does, that they do start to work towards true faithfulness in relationships. But not everybody wants to change. And so if you get in a relationship with somebody 
Look for two different things, okay? So number one, if they've got a past of cheating, 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 and they don't show any commitment to wanting to change their life, there's a very high probability that they will cheat on you. Secondly, when they got when you got into a relationship with them, you felt like you were the only person in your life. But let's say that later you found out that they were married. They just didn't tell you about that. And so they were already in a relationship with you while they were, or they got in a relationship with you while they were already in a relationship. Look back to see if that's a pattern, that they have done that a couple times. Because what that means is, even though they get committed to you, if that's their pattern, there's a chance they'll be cheating on you. And so if they did it with you, somebody said, they'll do it to you. So pay attention to past relationships and their moral code within those relationships. Number five, unreliable. So a person who violates the moral code of honesty of faithfulness, of reliability, of responsibility. So they make promises they don't keep. They often say they're going to be at some place and they don't show up at all, or they're consistently late to stuff, coming in late. Or they make plans and they commit to them. They say they commit, then they cancel plans all the time and get out of it. And what begins to happen is you realize... I'm having trouble trusting this person. Now, here's where it can get frustrating. A lot of unreliable people, when they get in a relationship with you, they demand that you trust them totally. And what happens when you are struggling to trust them, they get defensive and they accuse you of not being a trusting person and that you should trust them. What you need to be reminded of is this. True trust is earned. A deep sense of a person, I'm confident that they're trustworthy so I can trust them totally, that comes only after living with them being trustworthy for a length of time. And so trust has to be earned. So if you get in a relationship with somebody and they demand trust right away, but haven't proven they're trustworthy, that can be a red flag. And then when you see them doing lots of unreliable things, another red flag. Now, just a, a note. Some people, when they fall in love with unreliable people, they develop the bad habit of picking up all of that person's responsibilities and doing them for them, so that they look reliable to the outside world. And therefore, they enable that person to stay irresponsible because they are doing for them what that person should be doing for themselves. So be careful that you do not fall into that trap. Final one for tonight. Be very aware, and this I think is quite a big one. Be very aware of people who blame others for their feelings, their problems, their life. And so they might turn to you at some point in the relationship early on and say, you make me feel so angry, or you really upset me, or you are really depressing me. As if it's your responsibility for how they're feeling. Or if they are having trouble holding down work, a job, and they blame the boss. They blame everything and don't own their part. Red flag, red flag. So a person who always has an excuse for their bad behavior and their bad decisions, who doesn't take responsibility for their own choices, for making sure that the right thing is done for keeping their commitments. Red flag, big, big red flag. And if you find somebody like that, there can be a whole bunch of different issues that contribute to a person blaming everybody for their life. 
You can have a person who's got lots of shame issues and therefore just can't face that they failed and they got to blame somebody else as a way to avoid looking at their shame. You can have a narcissist who will never admit they're wrong and therefore it's always got to be somebody else's fault. And if you get a relationship with them, at some point it will become your fault for the way they feel. And then it can also be a person who's been a victim for so long that they've been powerless for so long to change their circumstances to deal with issues because their authority figures as a child wouldn't allow them to, that they just became a perpetual victim. And that's how they continue to live. And others have always come and bailed them out and done stuff for them. But if you get in a relationship with that kind of person, you're going to end up feeling like their parent and they're going to feel like, to you, like they're a little child, an irresponsible, immature person. So a person who has the habit of blaming, huge red flag. So that's the first six. All of them had a component of a moral code. So let me end by pulling this together for tonight. So what I hope you've seen is red flags reveal unhealthy people or another way to say that is unhealthy character. So I want to talk about this idea of character. So unhealthy flags or red flags are just bad character things, unhealthy character. And when you have red flags then with unhealthy character in a person, it will create an unhealthy relationship. So what is character? Character is all about the choices we make about how we're going to cope, how we're going to live, how we're going to relate to people. So will I lie or will I be honest? Will I hang in there when, when things are difficult or will I bail out? Will I do what's right even when it might cost me? Or will I always take a way that's easy even if it means cheating and stealing? So character is about choices connected to morals. Okay, but it goes beyond that. And I want to get to that in just a minute. I'm hoping what you're seeing, and this is critical, you can be attracted to a person because they have a nice body and a nice funny personality and they're lively, but those two things, their personality and their body, do not make lasting, meaningful, healthy relationships. What makes lasting, meaningful, healthy relationships with true intimacy is good character. A person who lives by a moral code that is right. And so a person who's got healthy character is a person that you're going to see with healthy relationships. You're going to see them that they have a life of joy because they're not getting all the negative consequences of bad character. Those are the kind of people you want to make a healthy support group. Character becomes essential. So, let me put it this way. I can choose to tell the truth once, but that doesn't make me a person with honest character. A person with honest character is a person who chooses to tell the truth once, and then twice, and then three times, and then it's a habit, and then it just becomes who they are. So it is the repeated, repeated moral choices over and over again. But as we've seen, a person can have moral code with the wrong attitude. So character is more than just living by a moral code. It's living by a moral code with the right attitudes. It's not just right actions. It's right attitudes, values, priorities. That's what creates good character. And that is what creates safe people. Now let me give you just two things to help you realize what that is. What is your character right now? And a lot of people would come to me and say, oh, I'm very honest and all of that. So what I say is this, two things. Number one, if you were somewhere and you could do whatever you want and you would never get caught and there would never be a negative consequence, 
what would you choose to do? That reveals who you are. Or to give that from a little different angle. Deep, deep, deep down, what do you believe will make you happy? Because your definition of what will make you happy is what you're going to act on and that will become your character. So if you think just being able to indulge all your sexual desires is going to make you happy, then your character will have stuff around the sexual area that's a red flag because that will not lead to true happiness. So deep down, what do you believe will make you happy? That is what you, your character is formed from. Okay, so let me give it to you one more way. Your limbic brain says, I want to be happy now, and I want to not think about negative consequences. Limbic brain does not create good character, creates bad character. Cortex says, I want to do healthy, and that is what is loving and what produces long-term healthy consequences, that produces good character. So complex trauma creates limbic brain people who need to be that to survive, but what they begin to realize in adult life is it created some unhealthy character. They lie, they cheat, they had to do that to survive, but now that's messing up their life. And so what I hope you will begin to realize is to be a safe person, to have a healthy support network, I need people with good character, that's good actions with a moral code, good attitudes, values, and priorities. So that's the end of part one to our new series. We're going to take a short break, and then I'll come back and do the Christian part. And if you're not interested in that, that's fine. Thank you so much for being part of this first part of this new series. Well, welcome back. We talked about five different families in the first part. And what I wanted to do in the second part is to show you kind of what the Bible says about the families of our life. And there's the five are going to be included, but I'm going to kind of put it in three different categories that the Bible talks about. So the first mention of families in the Bible is in the very second chapter of the Bible, at the very beginning, at the very end of the creation account. In Genesis 2.24, it says this. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother, that's biological family, and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Second family. Family that you create your own biological family. And so, right there in that verse, you see that you start off with this biological family, which includes the extended family, um, grandparents, aunts, uncles, and siblings, and all of that. And then you have the second family, which is that family based on love and a commitment to another person where you create your own children, and that brings with it in-laws as well. So, let me just 
give you this. When you look at the Bible and it talks about marriage, it doesn't talk about marriage ceremonies as the emphasis. You notice this very first part of the Bible. What does God say about what constitute marriage? It's not going before a judge or a pastor and signing a contract. What it is saying is true marriage starts with a heart commitment. And that has two components. Number one, you leave mom and dad and you join or cleave or become one, are glued together. That is what constitute true marriage in God's eyes. And what we have done, sadly, is we put more emphasis on the external and not on the internal, and it's led to all kinds of problems. But that's what God says right up front. But then as you go through the Bible, there's a third family. And you find it when Jesus is on this earth in his ministry. So let me read you from Matthew 12. As Jesus was speaking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. So his biological family is there wanting to talk to him. Someone told Jesus, your mother and your brothers are outside and they want to speak to you. Jesus asked, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples and said, look, these are my mother and brothers. Anyone who does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. What he is saying there is he's created a third family, a surrogate family, a spiritually based family. It's made up of people who do the will of God. It's made up of people who share the same deepest passions, the same deepest commitments and values, priorities. That is the surrogate family. So we've got biological family. We got the family that you create through joining with another person. And then you've got this surrogate spiritual family, people who share the same heart, the same deepest commitment. So the question then is, which family has the greatest priority? And this is not very important to think through because I think a lot of people have got it wrong at times. So, John 19, let's start there. Jesus is being crucified, and it says, Standing near the cross was Jesus' mother. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, that was John, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And then he said to the, this, this disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. So, Jesus, even though he had a surrogate family and a biological family, when he's dying, he still shows his commitment to take care of his mother. And it's possible because Jesus was the eldest son that his father, Joseph, Mary's husband, has died. And so it's his responsibility to make sure his mom is cared for since women couldn't go out and get a job. And so since he's dying, he gives that responsibility to John. But what I want you to see is there's still a commitment, a deep commitment to his biological family, to their care. But let's go back to Genesis 2, where the first commandment around marriage is leave your father and mother. And the idea of that is that this new family that you create where you join and become one is to take priority over your birth family. And what that means is this. You will still value the input from your birth family if they're healthy, but your partner's input has greater priority. It carries greater influence with you you are going to still care about taking care of the needs of your family, your birth family, but your partner and your children's needs come ahead of those. And so what, what God is saying at the very beginning is remain respectful and caring of your birth family, 
But this new family is to have a higher place in your heart, your commitment, and your love. Okay, now let me take it further. Now let's think of this surrogate family, Matthew 10. Jesus says, I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. In other words, it sounds like Jesus is saying, I've come to destroy families. Your enemies will be right in your own household. Now, I should say he's not really saying that. I'll explain it in a, in a moment. But he says this, If you love your mother or father more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. Or if you love your son or daughter more than me, you are not worthy of being mine. In other words, he seems to be saying, you shouldn't care about this family you created or your biological family. Let me give you another one that will confuse you even more. Luke 14. If you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father and mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Now, what is Jesus saying? Those verses sound like he's really saying turn against your family. All negative stuff. Here's his point. He is saying your allegiance to God needs to surpass all your other families. Okay? So you're still supposed to take care of your mom and dad. You're still supposed to love your children and your wife. But your love for God is greater than all of that. So he's not saying hate your family, but he's saying your loyalty and commitment to me should be so great that it might be times, there might be times when it looks like you don't care about your family or they will accuse you of not caring about them. So let me say two things here. Some people have used this verse to say that they should be committed to church activities and to the needs of the church and serving God to the neglect of their own children. That is not being said. One of the things that a husband and a father has or a mother has is the top commitments in my love life need to be next to God, my children and each other. Church should not take away from that. But let me put it this way. Almost over 30 years ago, I had this sense that God wanted me to become a pastor. And after becoming a pastor, we were asked to come to Winnipeg. That was a long way away from our families of birth. Some families, if they had not been healthy, when, if we had gone to them and said, we believe God wants us to move our family to Winnipeg, and we only had a, a small son at that time, six months old. An unhealthy family would have said, we don't like that. We, we're we're going to fight that. We want you to stay here with us. After all, we're your blood. You should be here. That could have easily happened. And, and, and then for me to stay loyal to what I think God was leading me to do, I would move to Winnipeg, but it would look like I was turning against my family that's kind of what he's talking about but thankfully we had parents who also wanted us to follow God's will for our life and they said yes we'll miss you and it'll hurt not being able to watch our grandchildren grow up as often but we want you to follow God and so what Jesus is saying is following God as your highest priority won't in every decision cause your birth family to think you don't love them, but there may come times when following God will cause you to go against the wishes of the family. And they might be upset, and they might accuse you of not being loving. And those will be hard decisions to make. And so what is the priority? Well, God has to be number one. Then birth, or then the family by marriage, and then birth family, all have priorities, all have, I have responsibilities too. I just have to get the priorities right. And that is kind of how the Bible lays it out. But there 
I want you to also see is this. Do you realize that Jesus put a lot of priority in his surrogate family? He looked at the disciples who were following him, and he said, this is now my family. And what I think he is saying is this. Our biological family is important, and it carries a very important role when we're younger and maybe as we get older. But all of us creates our own family, not just in marriage, but in our support group. And it's people that share similar priorities and goals. And Jesus is saying that is an essential part of life as an adult. And that is so important as we go into this series is to realize that Jesus valued surrogate families and saw the necessity of people having them. Now let me end with this. Do you realize that for a surrogate family or any family, how do you know if they're safe? Well, if you follow what we've been doing, they're safe if they surrender to God so that they love God more than anything else in their life. Because when they love God more than anything else in their life, then they have God's priorities. They live by God's moral code, which is healthy. They love other people and care for them. They let them follow God. So the safest people, the most healthy people, the, are the people who have truly surrendered to God. Now, I have to qualify that. Because for some of you, that's where it gets tricky. You've had a lot of people in your life who said they've been totally surrendered to God, who said they live by God's authority, but they have been very unsafe people. And so that's going to be part of your journey, is figuring out how can I tell whether a person who claims to love God with all their heart really does. Because I've met a lot of people that say they love God and are surrendered to God who are disasters and have done a lot of damage. And so as we go through this series, what I hope you'll begin to realize, it's how they define God. Because some of the people, the God that they define, in my opinion, is not the true God of the Bible. And so that's where you have to begin to go to is, what is their definition of this God that they surrender to? Well, that's the beginning of this new series. I hope just this little bit will give you a bit of a biblical framework as we move forward in building a healthy support network. Thanks for being part of another Friday. Hope you have a great weekend. Let's just close in prayer. Father, thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that you have designed for us a life that can lead to great joy. And for people who did not have healthy biological families, that it is possible for them to find healthy surrogate families. And I just pray that as people begin on that journey, that you would guide them, that you would protect them, that you would lead them to healthy, safe people that they can create a family that is meaningful for them. Amen. See you next Friday.